Hi there, everyone. Thank you for tuning back in. And I am here with Alexander Terrence, who wanted to provide us with an update on how things have been going with him as we're getting ready to release his documentary and a lot of exciting updates. So why don't we take it from the top? Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's been going on with you in terms of your recovery and your progress? Um, well, with my recovery, I've been I have been doing a lot of physical therapy exercises. I've actually been doing them on YouTube and they've been great. And um, I've also been getting um, um, acupuncture done from Dr. Um, Amy Lai in Memphis, Tennessee. She's been just great with her acupuncture. She's very knowledgeable also. Awesome. And how have you found acupuncture has helped? Um, have you felt, I know a lot of people say that from the moment that they actually insert the needle, that they can feel the healing beginning, that they can feel it in their nerves. Have you experienced that effect? And what has that been like for you? Well, I'm going to tell you, I mean, I'm not ashamed to say it. Uh, when she first, when I first did it, she told me that when she was putting the needles inside of my scalp, it was going to help my hand. And um, I actually started crying. I broke down because my hand felt normal, um, you know, because I've, it had been feeling so heavy from my stroke. It actually felt normal when she did that. I, I broke down crying. So I can't believe it feels normal. You know? But wow. she's been great. Yeah, she's had been well with my walking and everything. You know, she, my left arm and everything was weak. And it's been building up strength because of her. So as you've continued to heal, what have been some of the biggest challenges for you? You know, what areas of the body have been the most complex? Uh, I would say um, my balance and um, raising my left arm and the strength, not having the strength in my arm also, and my hand, I was... Um, if I didn't concentrate, my hand will open up and I would drop whatever I had. But now I'm actually holding on to things without thinking about it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that's really challenging. And have you dealt with any kinds, when you talk about balance, I know a lot of times that can be related to your inner ear. Have you mm -hmm. had any challenges or any ringing or anything associated with your ear as you've been kind of recuperating and going through that process? No, actually, I haven't. And I guess I've been pretty lucky on that. But I know she has put needles in on the outside of my ear. And wherever she put the needle, she tell me where it's going to help a certain parts of my body. And she's been absolutely correct every time she does it. Wow. Yes. That's she a lady that knows her stuff. <laughs> yeah, she was in my sinuses and stuff the last time I went. I had a bad drainage in my sinuses. And she cleared up my sinuses. So I was like, wow. So you're telling me that somebody actually put a needle in your nose to clear your sinuses? No, she put it in my head and on my chest. And my oh stomach. my gosh. Wow. Yes. That's it insane. Yes, it did. Wow. So she was able to find the exact spot on your head and in your chest where it would affect your nose and clear out all your sinuses and everything. Wow. Yes, she did. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. It really is. She also, um, she she would look at my tongue. She had messed up my tongue. And she would tell me, you're eating cheese, right? You're eating a lot of nuts, right? I said, yeah, how do you know? She said, I've been doing this a long time. And she asked me to stop eating so much cheese and nuts until we finish our, you know, our, our session with acupuncture. And I, I've done it, and she's been like really, really helping me a lot. I'm really curious though. Why would she want for you to stop eating cheese and nuts? Cheese and nuts seem to be something that would be very healthy for you. Yeah, she said that it would progress my recovery for acupuncture. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, I guess you don't know what you don't know, right? right. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Wow. Well, I'm glad to hear that acupuncture has played such a, a large part in your recovery. I know that, you know, a lot of people, myself included, are too chicken to go and get those needles. You know, even though I've heard it's tremendously effective for many, many years, I'm straight up too chicken to go and get it done. And I've had a lot of friends who have had it done and who have seen, you know, just tremendous results. 
um, by doing so. So I guess obviously you're living proof of this fact. Right. It's um, it's not as bad as it looks. It's not as bad as it looks. And I can honestly say, I understand why I see a lot of athletes getting it done after they play their games, they get acupuncture done. I see why. So how would you say then, you know, from your experience, you know, I know a lot of people do like cryotherapy, for example, for like muscle repair and things like that. How would you say that, you know, from your experience that acupuncture is different than, or is better than, you know, cryotherapy? How, I mean, obviously cryotherapy is, you know, for relaxing and recovery and things like that. I don't really know exactly how acupuncture works. Um, how would you explain that to a normal person who's watching? Well, uh, after I have my session, um, I'm very relaxed. I'm, I'm actually very tired. But um, she told me that also I would have like a lot of energy, and I have been having a lot of energy because of it. And um, it's um, it's also helped my circulation in my body because my left leg has swollen because it wasn't getting circulation and it's going down now. It's like almost normal now. And um, like I said, she really helped me with my balance. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, your physical therapy, because I know you started off and you were going to traditional physical therapy, but then, you know, yes. because of insurance challenges, you know, you started kind of working out on your own and doing your own physical therapy sessions. So let's talk a little bit about that for a minute, because that's pretty awesome. Yes. Um, I went to St. Jude. I didn't have insurance. So they gave me like a charity thing for two months. And I still needed physical therapy after that. And um, I just decided to go on YouTube and I saw a lot of physical therapists giving um, education on physical therapy. And, I, and it really helped me advance in my recovery a lot. Awesome. So I'm- I didn't do it, I didn't give up, you know. I kept uh, my mind, you know, the mind is a powerful thing. So I told myself, you know, I was overcoming this and I'm overcoming it. Yeah, no, that's really impressive. I mean, a lot of people would, you know, just totally give up. I mean, most people wouldn't even, if they would just say, I don't have insurance, I'm not going to, you know, find a way forward. I don't know what I'm going to do. And would just stop right there. They wouldn't even think, you know, I have the internet available to me. I can go out and find these videos on YouTube and I can find my own path forward. I mean, that's really inspiring. Yes. I was also told um, after my stroke that um, I wouldn't walk until December of this year, but I was walking like uh, wow, less than three months. That's impressive. Yes. So they were telling you that you wouldn't be walking until December of this year and you were yes. walking three months three after. Wow. Yes. Wow, that's that's really, really something. Yes, it is. Yes, it was. But I never gave up. And I always had the mindset I was going to overcome this. So if, you know, like if anybody's ever in a situation, always believe in yourself. Continue to have faith in God and know that God will deliver you. Yeah. And what do you feel like really sustained you, you know, on those difficult moments when you really wanted to give up? I know, you know, you've been through um, you know, some really challenging experiences, I know, based on, you know, our discussion of your story in the past, um, you know, what do you think, you know, really reinforced you to keep going through this and kind of help you overcome? Um, I read um, Psalms a lot, and it encouraged me a lot, and uh, gave me hope, and uh, my family was very, was very much in my corner, very hard. Uh, um, motivational to me to continue going and knowing that I was going to overcome this. So that helped out a, 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 a lot. Gotcha. And aside from, you know, just your family, if you were, you know, to look back at other people who were a part of your life, like maybe there's a teacher or maybe, you know, someone who had been a part of your life, maybe it's a mentor, you know, somebody that you look up to. Is there anyone in particular who's been a part of your life that has really helped you kind of get through those difficult times, you know, and kind of find that path forward. I know that 
for me, you know, I have like several teachers, I have several mentors that, you know, I've had from the time that I was 11 or 12 years old, you know, that have helped me grow up. How about you? Um, one has been my bishop, Bishop Omega Shelton. And um, the other one is, he don't know it, but it's been Dr. Charles Stanley in Atlanta. Yeah. Because I, I watched a lot of his sermons. That's a pretty amazing one right there. And, you know, having access to his platform, you know, 24-7, 365, whenever you need it. I mean, it's, you know, his stuff has been translated into 153 languages. That's pretty amazing. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing what he's been able to do. Awesome. So in terms of, you know, what does your next couple of years look like? What do you want to do now that you've come through this and you've kind of come out on the other side? How do you want to affect other people around you? How do you want to tell your story? And how do you want to continue to grow both as a person? And how do you want to help contribute to the community? Well, one thing I want to do, um, I like to do volunteer work in the hospital. And um, I don't think now they'll let me do it because of COVID. But I would like to inspire people to continue to uh, not give up and not give up hope. Um, Because like John said in the Bible, if you don't have hope, your prayers are for nothing. So I always have hope and never give up. And I like to encourage people at that point. You know, I'm hoping to start my, my window cleaning business back and open franchises so the people can start their own business also. Awesome. So you're thinking about expanding your business and opening up some franchises. And yes. um, in terms of, you know, what your business looks like in the future, you know, would you want to do some additional outreach work to the community with your business? And, oh, you know, absolutely. And that's kind of what I was thinking, you know, finding additional ways to be able to inject some good back into the community. It's always amazing how, you know, when something bad happens, sometimes the community reaches out and really helps you up, you know, and sometimes you have to kind of wait and after you come out on the other side of that, kind of look back and go, how can I contribute back to the community? You know, oh, yes. it's kind of cool like that. Yes, it is. It's like a hand up. And then, you know, when you get back, it's a hand up, you know, it's kind of the outreach, which is kind of really awesome. So I also in want to um, mention um, St. Francis Hospital that took me in when I had a stroke. Their entire staff was just wonderful. And where are they? Are they in Memphis? They're in Memphis, Tennessee. But the hospital I went to was in Barley, Tennessee. Nice. Their entire staff was wonderful. I have no, I had no complaints yeah and i know that it's really challenging you know particularly right now for all the doctors and nurses out there with covid you know i mean it is there's yeah. so much going on and particularly you know for anyone who's listening who's not in the in the american south you know it's uh the numbers here are pretty crazy too we're still in the middle of covid you know yes. a lot yes. of other places in the world this is something that you know is is over or, you know, the Delta variant is kind of in the rear view, but for us, it's still very much a thing. So very, very excited that they did such a, a great job, you know, taking care of you and helping. And are they still reaching out? You know, are they still in contact and following up with you and that kind of thing now? Actually, they are, they are. I figured as much. They're, they're following me, asking me, how's my progress going and all everything. They're just wonderful people. They offer to pray for me and everything. And wow. they say, we'll sit down on the phone. They'll pray for me on the phone. That's pretty awesome. So yes. let's talk about your documentary now, because that's getting ready to come out. And that's really exciting. So in your story, you know, I mean, obviously, it's mostly the story of your recovery. And there's still so much more that we have to tap into and, you know, obviously do a part two, because we have to actually talk about, you know, your experiences in Atlanta and everything that happened there. That's a whole nother story. But, right. you know, how was it getting to work with, uh, you know, Mike? And how did you feel about, you know, everything that was filmed? Were you happy with the outcome? And what do you hope that the message is of the documentary? Mike went, Mike was, um, he was awesome. I met him, his wife and his son. They were, they were very awesome. And um, I appreciate everything they did coming down here and they shooting it for me. Um, what I hope to get out of the documentary, I hope to, that it inspires people who are dealing with difficulties in life and knowing that um, that's just part of life and that a lot of us were built 
for adversity and to overcome adversity. And God gets his blessing by us overcoming things and having faith in him that he will deliver us. And um, that's what I hope to get out of that. Everything's about the Lord. Absolutely. And I think sometimes people don't really know what they can endure and what they can go through until they come out in that situation, right? People don't know what they're actually built for until right. they find themselves in a difficult situation. And yeah, I think, I'm one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's, you know, those defining moments are what really make a person into a strong person. I can't, yeah, there was a, an amazing Bob Marley quote. I'm trying to get the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of you never know how strong you can actually be until you're going through it is oh, yes. the, the general idea. Um, I want to actually try and go back and get that hundred percent right, but it's an amazing idea and it's absolutely a hundred percent true. So where do you see, you know, kind of all of this fitting together? Do you still see yourself wanting to also take the lessons of the past as well from when you were with the APD and also kind of still turn that into a book? Do you, and where also do you see additional things coming forward? Um, as far as the APD, I, I, I do plan on doing a book because um, I had some issues on APD and um, my story wasn't fairly told and I would like people to know what really happened and explain them why it happened. Um, so, because APD told their story and um, the chief, who's the chief, he's passed on now. He lied very much and um, the lady who lied on me, she lied and her lawyer lied and I just like to tell the truth about what really happened. Wow. That's crazy. Um, it's just, uh, you know, absolutely insane to think that that many people who were in power, um, you know, in Atlanta, just because of their association with the governor would, you know, just be that corrupt. But it's something that, you know, we see all the time. I mean, yes, it's, you know. it, it's just, it's, it's crazy, but it's it's pretty status quo. And I think it's really but important now, for people to see that. I'm yes, sure. but now with, with social media, um, you don't have to depend on like the the mainstream media to tell when they lie on you, you don't have to depend on them to say, hey, will you to ask them to tell the truth? You know, you can put your own story right there with social media now because the media in Atlanta, they did a, they did a terrible job on me. Uh, they continued to lie on me, but it was actually Fox 5 News in Atlanta that told the truth. And um, they went out of their way to prove that I was innocent, which I was, I was very innocent. But the other stations, um, we learned that um, they said I made good, a good news story. That's why they continued to lie on me. Wow. They told me and my ex-wife that one person that worked for the news station said that that my story made a, a, a great story every night. So they continued to lie on me. They didn't care that it destroyed my life, but all they cared about was continuing to lie on me and sensationalizing the lie. Yeah, but you know, the collateral damage that happens from something like that to a person's life, you know, they don't think about what might seem like, you know, good ratings is destroying people's families. It's destroying people's lives. It's destroying, you know, all those relationships and that we work years to build, you know, it's, it's not okay. No, it's, it's not, not okay at it's all. Not okay at all. And I'm sure that that probably, you know, led to a lot of personal challenges and some loss and some career issues and everything else for you. Right. I'm not, um, I'm not a fan of Trump. Um, I'm not trying to get political or anything. I respect anybody's uh, views, but one thing Trump said when he called the media fake news, I'm not saying all the news, all the media is fake news, but there's a lot of fake news out there. And they told a lot of fake news on my story. And then they knew they were lying, they didn't care. Wow, well, as someone who uh, used to be a journalism major and who changed majors because mm -hmm. Um, I was told that if it, it bleeds, it leads. Um, I left the journalism field for the exact same reason, because I wanted to report the truth and not report something that was going to get garnish ratings. So that's, that's right. how I ended up being an author instead of being a journalist. So I can completely yeah. understand that. <laughs> yeah. And then when it, you know, it, it, 
I can deal with it, but when it hurts your family, you yeah. know, it just, you, you just say, we're kicking way, way too far, you know. Absolutely. So what's next for you? You know, I mean, you've come through this amazing journey. You've, you know, started to rebuild your life, obviously, after going through this epic journey and this recovery and everything else. You've got the documentary coming out. There's a book that's going to be coming out, you know, eventually. Uh, there are a lot of moving pieces here. You know, how, what would you say, you know, if you could do anything next, what would you do? And obviously, it's not going to Disneyland. So <laughs> what would you want to do next? Um, right now, I'm just... Uh, focusing on continuing to recover, I do believe I'm make a hundred percent recovery. Um, I do too. Um, also, um, uh, like I said, I like to do um, volunteer work and possibly at the hospitals, you know, to encourage people to continue to believe and continue to have faith, like I did. And um, I just, you know, pray and see what what steps god take me takes me have you thought by chance about possibly uh reaching out to um your new um friends over at the hospital of the place that took good, such good care of you and maybe talking to them about doing some volunteer work there i'm sure that you know people who are in a similar situation who have been admitted would absolutely love to see somebody who's come out on um, the other side. I really think that would probably be something that would be great for them, don't you think? Uh, yes, I do. I actually talked to them about that. Tell them I would love to do that when the COVID settles down. And, um, you know, like I said, they did a lot of things for me, like, because um, I was completely paralyzed on the left side. I couldn't move. They, you know, they, you know, I kind of felt, um, I'm not gonna say embarrassed, but I felt bad because they had to do certain things for me because I couldn't do it. But they assured me that it was okay and we're gonna do it, we're gonna take care of you. We know you're gonna beat this. And you know, I would like to come in and volunteer to help not only encourage people, but maybe, you know, I'd change a bay pad or anything, you know, just voluntarily, just just to help out anybody that needs help at the hospital. And that's I did talk to them about doing that. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Yes. And you know, if you wanted to leave our viewers you know with one message what would that one message be um stay focused um on your dreams never give up when you have a difficulty and um i always put god first and remember the mind is a powerful thing you believe you can achieve awesome that's uh, that's a very powerful message, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, and um, absolutely. So we'll be having a press release following this interview, and then after that, we'll be sharing the link of where people can go ahead and get started viewing your documentary. So really exciting I'm, stuff. I'm very excited about it. Very excited about it. Coming me, me too. I'm really excited to get this released and see everybody's reactions because we've been working on it for such a long time. So congratulations and, uh, you know, congratulations on the release of the documentary. Congratulations as well on all of the amazing progress. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much, Melissa. Talk to thank you later. You. Talk to you later. Take care. Bye-bye.